Hello, my brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Covenant of Grace Ministries YouTube channel. I am Reverend Steve Williams Jr. and I want to extend the love of Jesus Christ to all of my Covenant of Grace family, friends, and guests who are joining us today. Before we begin uh, with today's message, just want to take this opportunity to recognize Pastor Spradley for his uh, commitment to excellence for the body of Christ. I've really enjoyed his weekly sound bites that he, he has started and uh, he truly brought the word in his message on last Sunday when he talked about transferring the escrow account uh, blessings from heaven to our minds. So I know many of you have watched it, but if, though, if, if there's some that haven't, please check it out because you will truly be fed spiritually without a doubt. Amen. So before we start today's message, just want to give God thanks in prayer. Amen. So let's let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks today. We honor you, Father, for being who you are, being such a wonderful Abba, Father. Uh, Lord, we just want to open up our spiritual senses, Lord. Open up our spiritual eyes, spiritual ears. Open up our hearts, Father, to receive your word. Holy Spirit, be our divine teacher and give us a word from you that helps us to understand your wrath, God. Not from our perspective, but from your perspective. Help us to grow closer to you. Uh, like never before, and, and allow us to be better men and women of God as we as we finish this message, Father, than we were when we began this message. We give you thanks, honor, and glory in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We are continuing our teaching series on getting to know Yahweh, and we are going to cover part two of an attribute of God that is not very popular, uh, not only with folks in the world, but it's not popular with, with folks that are in the church as well. And that is God's wrath, okay? And we mentioned on last time that any discussion of God's character without mention of his wrath is an incomplete study. His wrath is just as important as his grace. His wrath is just important as his love. His wrath is just as important as his goodness, amen? So we discussed, as we began talking about God's wrath, we discussed that his wrath is a result of his displeasure of sin and his judgment against it. And one thing we talked about um, as we describe God as a righteous judge is that his goodness is attributed to his wrath because God does not allow evil to go unaddressed, okay? But unlike humanity, God's wrath is balanced. So he just doesn't fly off the handle as we do sometimes, okay? And we closed our teaching last time by discussing how God's wrath is linked uh, to his judgment and his holiness. And we said that God's wrath is necessary. It's, it's his necessary and it's his natural reaction to anything that opposes his holiness church. Um, and we, we touched on this last point um, and, and it's that God judges sin while loving the sinner, okay? He hates sin, but he loves the sinner. But God cannot overlook the sinner in judging the sin because the sinner is the one who committed the sin. So I hope we understand that, that perspective. We have to deal with the consequences of sin. And, and, and God recognizes that that's, that's, that's what a holy God does. So as we begin part two of getting to know Yahweh, his wrath, um, let's discuss how God's wrath is just. Um, and uh, our title scripture today is, is in Romans chapter one, verse 18. And I know some of you who've been listening to Pastor Spradley's sound bites will recognize this voice. 
uh, this ver this verse today, uh, excuse me, but uh, it was one of the one of the first sound bites that Pastor Spradley did. So let's go ahead and read Romans one verse eighteen. It says, "For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, in their wickedness, suppress and stifle the truth." Okay, you see God's wrath in his response to that, which is in its essence is against God's nature, okay? God's wrath is not cruel, but his wrath is just. You see, God wants justice. He wants order in his universe, just like we want justice and order in our society. But unlike God, our justice system in society, it is limited. And it's also imperfect because of man's sinful actions. But God, on the other hand, he is holy. That's one of his attributes, right? And he is just. And as the song says, God is perfect in all of his ways. So God must respond to sin. And he does so by cutting the sinner off from his goodness. So when we look at God's wrath, we must look at God's entire character and not just a facet of it. You know, many want to focus on God's goodness while there are others who just want to focus on God's wrath, you know? But here's the thing, he exercises one or the other based on our response to him, okay? And I know there are some folks, you know, who focus just on God's love, who often say, you know, how could a God of love do that? Well, that's where we see in our, in our title scripture, the answer, we see the answer in our title scripture in Romans 1 and 18. God's wrath is revealed from heaven. So reveal, that word revealed means not hidden. It means transparent. It means evident. So that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Because Pastor Spradley spoke about this in his first soundbite. He taught about God's wrath. And he said it, his wrath is designed to rid the world of folk who suppress the truth. You see that? God wants us to see his wrath because his wrath is a part of his nature. And, and here's the thing that we got to understand. Whether we like this part of God, or not, it is what it is, and we have to deal with. It, okay, it's not not to be. I'm not trying to 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 be mean, but we we're the people that have to adjust. The reason why we have to to adjust is this: the scriptures teach us that God does not change. He is consistent, you know, and He's not going to change His ways. All right. We have to change. And those of us who are parents, you know, we have standards and we have methods and practices in our homes and our children must respect them if they're going to continue to live in our homes. Right. So who does the adjusting in the home? The children or the parents? I'm hoping that your answer is the children because the, they are not the authority figures in the house. Right. And the same, the same practice applies with God, our Heavenly Father. We are living in his house and we need to adjust to his methods and his standards and his practices. Amen. So let's touch on the last part of the verse 18. And the, the issue that he talks about in that last part is that people suppress the truth or refuse to accept the truth. And because people choose to suppress the truth, this leads to God's wrath. That word suppress means to hold down. It's almost like when you have a beach ball and you're in, your, in a swimming pool and you, when you suppress it, you, 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 it's almost like pushing that, you know, because that, that beach ball wants to float up in the water. And in order for you to, uh, to get that, suppress it, you have to push that, that beach ball down in the water. So in this illustration, folks are pushing down the truth, just like we push down that beach ball in the water. 
And God's wrath is a response to folks suppressing the truth, okay? And that's why it's so important that the body of Christ, we all must stand on God's truth. And we must remind ourselves and others that God's holy indignation reacts against sin on an ongoing basis, okay? And this is why Paul, as he, as he writes Romans, he, he, and he writes this specific verse, that's why he was inspired by God to write this in the present tense, okay? God's wrath began at the very beginning in Genesis, and it continues on in the end in Revelations. We see in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve, we see his wrath begin. They were kicked out of the garden due to sin. God's wrath was in action. Even Jesus, his only begotten son, couldn't bypass God's wrath when all of our sins were placed on him on the, at the cross, at Calvary Church. Think about that. If not even God's sinless son escaped his wrath, we should all take this aspect of God's character serious. And I'm going to say this again. If Jesus, God's only begotten son, failed to escape his father's wrath, we should all take this aspect of God's character serious. Amen. All right. Let's talk about God's wrath against the unrighteous. God's wrath against the unrighteous. Why does God reveal his wrath in the un against the unrighteous? Let's read uh, verse 19. Let's read, we're going to continue on with Romans chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 19 and 20 here. Uh, because that which is known about God is evident within them in their inner consciousness, for God made it evident to them for ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship, all his creation, the wonderful things that he has made so, they, that, so that they who fail to believe and trust in him are without excuse and without defense. You know, we, we've shared this before with other attributes of God. And here, here's the thing that I want to say. While we can't see God's essence, we can see God's effect in creation. We know through his creation that, th that he does exist. Amen. All right. Just like we see the, in the wind, we, we don't necessarily see the wind but we see the effects of the wind. And we very, very much so in the past month with all of the hurricanes that have impacted our country, you know? And here's the thing, between the truth that God put within us and what is evident around us, church, we are left without any excuse, okay? God has made his presence crystal clear. And here's the thing, our issue is not evolution, but it's devolution, all right? Our issue is not evolution, but it's devolution. Evolution means that man started small, but became great, okay? And, and, and we base evolution on in the physical. We base evolution on our technology. We base, base evolution on medicine, economics, sports. But here's the truth, okay? Mankind, humanity is really devolving. We started out good, but we continue to move further and further and further away from God, church. We are devolving spiritually and morally in society. There, in, in our society today, there is such a lack of reverence toward Yahweh and Yahshua. You know, 
there's such a, a lack of a respect toward God and, and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Fewer people are identifying themselves today as Christians than ever before. And, and on top of that, we have a lack of unity in the body of Christ. And it's probably even worse than it has ever been before. And some people may be asking, so why is this happening? And the answer is found in verse 21. It says, for even though they knew God as the creator, did they, they did not honor him as God or give thanks for his wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasonings and silly speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You see, folks don't treat like, don't treat God like he's God. That's the thing. Folks are not treating God like he is God. This is what we expect from the world. You know, they don't know God, all right? But we got folks who claim to know God on Sunday and who claim to worship him as God on Sunday. But what happens is they ignore him the rest of the week. Their hearts have become darkened. And you know what darkness symbolizes? It, it symbolizes an absence of God. That's, that's what that darkness represents, an absence, a separation from God. So let's continue on as we, we talk about God's wrath against the unrighteous. Let's continue to, to read uh, Romans 1, and we're going to read verses 22 and 23. It says, claiming to be wise, they became fool. And as a result, they exchanged the glory and maj majesty and the excellence of the immortal God for an image, worthless idols in the shape of mortal man and birds and four-footed animals and reptiles. And I know Paul is speaking, you know, to the church at Rome, but he's speaking to today's church as well. You see, you see the glory that was supposed to be given to Yahweh, the creator of the created has been exchanged today. And I'm, and, and I'm gonna use some other idols that we that we we can we can uh, recognize and, and, and link to fame, fortune, sex. That's right. Sex can become an idol. These things become idols. Anything that we place above our relationship with God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, this is what's happening in our society today. We have ever elevated everything but God to his rightful place, you know? So what does God do? How does God respond to us elevating the created over the creator? And we're going to read verses 24 through 26 because Paul gives us the answer here. He says, therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their own hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them, abandoning them to the degrading power of sin because by choice, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They suppressed that truth, church, and worship and serve the, cre the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading and vile passions you see when a when a society makes a choice to worship the idols the created over the creator god removes his restraint and he basically says do what you want to do but understand that you're going to have to deal with the consequences of your sin sinful actions okay can't we see the devolution here? Can't we see the devolution that's taking place in our society today? You know, God, this is what God did. He first gave them up to their general lust to fulfill the desires of their hearts. 
And, and what's happening is these lusts are beginning to take shape because now folks are coming up with all types of buck wild stuff and all types of degrading evil. And, and we see as you continue on and you read on in verse 26 and 27, he talks about this, 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 this uh, lust for sex. And he talks about, you know, having unnatural desires. And he talks about lesbianism. He talks about homosexuality. And in the righteous revelation of God's wrath, he redraws his restraint against sin. And now what happens is the consequences of sin and evil begin to spread across society. New diseases shows up, you know, natural disasters ensue, famine and inflation spreads, crime increases in our communities, wars, not just wars with guns, but political wars, social wars, and strife take over our society. The respect of life deteriorates, church. Life loses its values. Do we see this happening? You know, and here's the other thing that's very important that we need to understand. Families are in turmoil. That family unit is broken. And it's not, and, and it's not in, intact like it should be. That's the foundation. We see that happening today, church, all in our, in our communities, everywhere. It's, it's consistent. So we're going to go to this next slide and we're going to talk about some stages in devolution. We've already seen some of these stages, the first two stages, but we're going to talk about all four stages as we, we read. Um, I'm going to read verse Romans 8, I mean, Romans 1, verse 28. It says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, nor consider him worth knowing as their creator, God gave them over to a depraved or reprobate mind to do things which are improper and repulsive. Okay, so let's 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 go and, and, and look at these stages of devolution. Here's our first stage. Our first stage is our general passion. God allows us to pursue our general passions, our general lust that we have those things that we place above him, those things that we worship above him, okay? And God says, okay, do your own thing. So stage two comes around and what happened is folks begin to go buck wild and they start devising insane ways to satisfy their lusts, you know? And we talked about that and in, verse, in, in Romans 1, 26, people start taking their lust and doing the five things to satisfy them, okay? So here's the third stage. And we see this uh, in Romans 1, 28, is the reprobate mind. When you get to a point, when you have a reprobate mind, that's when humanity reaches a state where they can no longer think, perceive, or act right. They, that's when society becomes desensitized. They become numb to what's right anymore. Amen? So people, people basically go mad from a spiritual, moral, physical, and ethical standpoint. So, and, and, and so when we see a reprobate mind, you look in, at verse 29 through 31, it gives you all of the degradations that occur when folks have a, 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 a reprobate mind. You can read it all. It's all there. We see this in our society going on right now. Okay. But this is what I want to point out. Verse 32, because this is the fourth stage of, of devolution. We, let, let's read that. Although they know God's righteous decree and his judgment that those who do such things deserve death, yet they not only do them, but they even enthusiastically approve and tolerate others who practice them. Church, 
we know society has hit rock bottom in God's wrath when people do insane things and other people seek to legitimize it, to legalize it and be entertained by them, okay? When it's this bad, and I'm gonna keep it real with you, when it's this bad, it doesn't matter who is on the school board. It doesn't matter who is on the city council. It doesn't matter who's in the White House, okay? We have to be honest with ourselves. We are in this season right now in America. And it's due to devolution and the lack of godly leadership that we have in our families, in our churches, in our communities. You see, church, when the wrath of God is our problem, I'm going to tell you something. Our only solution is the mercy of God. I'm going to say that again. When the wrath of God is our problem, the only solution is the mercy of God. And we're going to talk about his wrath. We're going we're gonna to transition and talk about not only his wrath on earth's earth, but we're going to talk about God's eternal wrath, okay? God's eternal wrath. We're going to start off by, by reading Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Romans chapter 2, verse 5, it says, but because of your callous stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are deliberately storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You know, question many of you may ask is, you know, how can people deny and pervert the truth of God this bad badly? And the answer is this. The reason they do this is because they, these type of people do not want a Romans one God. They want a God that looks and acts just like them, you know? They want a God that they can manipulate. They want a God who will not hold them accountable for their sinful actions. And they want a God who actually justifies their actions. That is the boot bootleg. That is the bootleg version of God, but it's not the real thing, church. People may be saying, Jesus, 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 but the Jesus that they may be giving worship to isn't the true Jesus that we see in the Holy Scriptures. It's one that they developed in their minds. Let's look at God's wrath, not just from a now or history perspective, but let's look at it from an internal perspective. And there's a, a passage in, in the Psalms that talks about God's wrath being just like a bow being drawn back you know how you you draw back that bow when you have a bow and an arrow you pull that arrow back and, and, and it, it describes God's wrath like that you see in, in scriptures talks about the more sinners practice sin while refusing to repent and turn to God the further God pulls back his spiritual bow and the further he pulls back his spiritual bow of wrath the harder it will be, and the deeper it will penetrate us. You know, God's wrath will penetrate the unrighteous with great agony, okay, in, in, in due season. So we don't need to get upset because when we see evil folk, when they seem to be getting away with things, okay, God's wrath not only extends in history, but it also extends to eternity for those who are not in a personal relationship with him amen and in a personal relationship with his son jesus christ so let's let's take some time to understand a little bit more about god's eternal wrath and this eternal wrath the location uh, of, of this eternal wrath is hell all right the lake of fire some people call it we're going to read 
the gospel of Mark chapter nine, verse 48. And this is Jesus speaking. And he says in, in verse, we read in verse 47 and verse 48, it says, Jesus is saying, it will be better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. Where well, there are worm that feeds on the dead does not die and the fire is not put out. Wow. Hell has no death or no time when our conscience is at ease, church. Hell is a place of dissolution and great pain as a result of being eternally separated from God. I want to read another scripture that's in uh, Revelations 20, verse 10. It says, and the devil who had deceived them was hurled into the lake of fire and burning brimstone where the beast and the Christ and false prophets are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Do you see what hell is like? It is a place where torment will take place day and night forever. And here's something that we need to come to the realization of. If there's some folks that don't believe this, let me tell you something. You better be sure because no one can afford to be wrong about this. No one can afford to be wrong about hell. If you don't believe it, you better not be wrong about this one because if you miss this one, you're going to get a bill that you can't pay, okay? Church, this isn't a feel-good message. I know that, but the Holy Spirit wants us to understand this, and this is what we need to grasp. Our world has a life-threatening cancer that is ravaging us, and that cancer is called sin. And God's eternal wrath will be the outcome of this spiritual cancer unless we have a radical surgery to remove it. Amen. It is so important that we understand the seriousness of God's eternal wrath. And so to give you an illustration of God's eternal wrath, we're going to go to a passage. I know those who are COG uh, members are very familiar with those. And, and it's, it's a passage about uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And Jesus speaks to this. This account is given to us by Jesus himself. This is a true account. And uh, the scriptures found in uh, the gospel of Luke chapter 16, verses uh, 22 through 26. And the story is about two men. One was a rich man who lived a life of luxury. And the other man was a poor man who struggled throughout his early life. You know, both of them experience physical death. And we know that that's the equalizer. Death, physical death is an equalizer for every one of us. We're all going to experience that. Um, and Jesus shares with us an illustration of the two addresses of eternity, heaven and hell. Okay. So let's start off by reading verse 22. It says, now it happened that the poor man died and his spirit was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That's heaven, paradise. And the rich man also died and was buried. So, all right. We know that Lazarus was the poor man. When he experienced physical death, he changed his location from earth to heaven. The rich man died, and it talks about he was buried. So that makes me think, you know, the rich man, he had a funeral. They, they, and I can imagine if I wanted to kind of kind of reference to how things happen today, he probably had a lavish with a, a lavish funeral, you know. He 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 his funeral service, uh uh, was probably lavish with all kind of limos. He had a, a big, a big 
a funeral service program with folks from the community talking about uh, how nice he was as a person or how much stuff he had or all he did for the community, you know. But we notice something here. You no, know, doesn't matter how good people think you are. It doesn't matter how much money you have or you don't have. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. If you don't have a personal relationship with him, and this is what happened. We'll see in verse 23. It says in Hades, the realm of the dead, being in torment, we're talking about the rich man. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay. So the rich man went to hell and he was experiencing the eternal wrath of God. He was in torment. Amen. His richness could not save him from his agony. And this is what we need to learn. Also, from this particular passage, we notice that physical senses are, you know, when we experience physical death, our souls and our spirit is separated from our body. But you notice in this passage that, that, that the rich man has access to his physical senses. He can see, he can touch, he can hear, he can feel, he can taste. Those are still present with him, even though he's outside the body. All right. They're still intact. He sees, he sees Lazarus. He sees Lazarus sitting in the bosom of Abraham. And here's the key point that I, 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 we need to understand. The Holy Spirit had me to write this down. And you see it here. The tragedy of hell is not only what you are going through, but what you could have had and are missing, okay? The tragedy of hell is not only what you are going through, but what you could have had and are missing, okay? Let's read verse, the verse 24. It says, and he cried. This is, this is the rich man. He cried. He's crying out. He says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in severe agony in this flame. He is being tormented, church. And the rich man asked for a finger's, not, not, a, not a bucket or an ocean's worth of water. He's asking for a finger's worth of water. So here's the key point. Whenever you feel like a drop of water would change your existence, you are in bad shape. And that's the, that's the torment that that rich man is under right now. Okay, let's read verse 25 and 26. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, all the comforts and the delights, and Lazarus likewise, bad things, all of the discomforts and distresses. But now he is comforted here in paradise while you are in severe agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to come over from here to you will not be able and none may cross over from there to us. Now we know that the rich man, he did have a lot of stuff and there's nothing wrong with having things. But what was the rich man, the rich man allowed the, the things to have him and, and they became his idol. That's the, where the issue is. And, and so, Here's the worst part about hell. The worst part about hell is not, is not the agony of the, the, the fire. One of the other aspects that's the worst part about hell is this, is knowing that you could have addressed the issue of your eternal destiny, but you never did it. That's right. It's realizing that you didn't take seriously the eternal wrath of God, right? In the end, church, no help 
came from the rich man. He had all of his physical senses intact, but all he was experiencing was agony. He couldn't cross over. What happens at physical death is set for eternity. Your destination is set when you experience physical death. Your location of where you're going to be at, heaven or hell, is set for eternity. Amen. And here's a key point. God will eternally quarantine all those who are not rightly related to him so that they don't mess up the enjoyment of heaven for those who are rightly related to him. Amen. I hope we see those key points in this passage about the rich man and Lazarus. It is a very profound message and it uh it definitely changed my my thinking about uh God's wrath and, and his eternal wrath. And I hope that this teaching, if you get a chance to read it in your spare time, please do so. Amen. All right, we're gonna move on. Um we're going to talk about the king and his son. And I'm going to tell you a story about that. And uh, Before I begin, I, I want us to be reminded that the Bible illustrates the unsaved. It illustrates the unsaved as dangling over hell. Just one heartbeat, just one act of violence or one accident away from God's eternal judgment. You know, the lost, the unsaved are being held only by the grace of God, amen? And when he releases his grip, they are gone to hell eternally. But here's the good news. There is an escape church, but a choice has to be made. All right. We learned in part one of this teaching series about God's wrath is that God created hell for Satan and his goons, not for people. When we choose not to repent, as we seen, and when we choose not to place our faith in Jesus Christ, we fall under Satan's curse. And God's justice demands payment for sin. But in God's mercy, he provided a substitute to take our punishment for us. And so to help us understand who our substitute is, I'm going to tell you this story about, the, about a king and his son. You know, there was a king who ruled over some very wicked people. And so he made a law and he said that anyone who violated the law will have both their eyes put out. However, the first person to violate the law was his own son. So the king was faced with a dilemma, right? A big dilemma. Justice demands that he put his son's eyes out, right? But how can the king balance his justice with his love? So this is what the king decided to do. What he did is he decided to put out one of his son's eyes, but he also decided to put out one of his eyes as well. He put out one eye of his son and he put out one of his own eyes. So whoever saw the two of them together saw justice and love. Right? Justice, because the two eyes were put out as the law demanded, right? Love, because the king loved his son so that he sacrificed his own eye for him. Now, let's look at it from God. God took this even further, church. He took this even further. His son, Jesus Christ, paid it all for us, our sins, our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Jesus paid it all on Calvary Church. And with Christ, 
it cost him more than just denying church. It cost him his life. He paid it all for us. As the song said, you paid it all up on the cross. You bled and died because I was lost. So here I am surrendering all. Yes, Lord, hear my cry. Thank you, Jesus. You paid it all. Thank you, Jesus. This is why God will not allow, he, he does not tolerate people rejecting Jesus Christ. All right? That's why he will not, he will not tolerate people rejecting Jesus Christ because he is eternal. God let his eternal son pay an eternal price for our eternal sin so that eternal people might live with him eternally. I'm going to say that again. God let his eternal son pay an eternal price for our eternal sin that eternal people might live with him eternally. Amen. And here's the thing. When we reject the God who paid the price and bore the wrath of God due to us through his son for our sin, then this is what happened. We will face eternal consequences, church. You see, God paid too high a price for us to play games with his wrath. Amen. Let's uh, continue to read. We're going to read. We read verses Romans 5, 8 through 10. It says, but God clearly shows and proves his love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, we have now been justified, declared free of the guilt of sin by his blood. How much more certain is it that we will be saved from the wrath of God through him? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, it is much more certain, having been reconciled, that we will be saved from the consequences of sin by his life. That is, we'll, we will be saved because Christ lives today. Amen. We are saved from the wrath of God, not by attending church in person or virtual or by being a nice person or by doing good deeds in the community. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 8 and 9. Okay. That's where I got that from. All right. Praise God. Yes. And here's the thing. I know many of you are saying, hey, well, Reverend Steve, I'm already saved. This, the, what does this all have to do with me? This shouldn't apply to me, right? And my response is true. Those of us who are born again will not experience the eternal wrath of God. However, we are not exempt from God's wrath in the earth, in history, right now. That's his divine discipline, church. And we still have to deal with the consequences of sin while we're here on earth. An example of, uh, uh, of God's divine discipline, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 11 and 30 when he writes about the people of the church who were eating up the communion, prevent, preventing others from partaking in the communion. And Paul mentioned, he said, that's why some of you are sick and are dying. He said, falling asleep, but that means dying because of their actions, their sinful actions. You know, we, here's another example. And I've got this one on the list in Acts, in the book of Acts, Acts 5, 1 and 11. This is with Peter, Peter's encounter with Ananias and Sapphira. That's another, if you take time, read it we see God's wrath happening in the body, in, in the church, in this particular example here. Um, here's the thing, we are not exempt of God's wrath on the earth, okay? But here's the thing that we do have that can help us, and that's God's gift of repentance. God's gift of repentance, and it, repentance is a gift from God, and it's a beautiful thing repentance is an internal 
decision. It's a change of heart and a determination to turn from sin and turn toward God in order to restore our fellowship with him. Amen. And here's the thing. Repentance can limit some or sometimes it can limit all of the consequences of sin. And I want to read this uh, for 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. It says, yet I am glad now, not because you were hurt. Paul speaking to the church. And not that you were hurt and made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance and you turned back to God. For you felt such a grief, such as God meant you to feel, so that you, may not, you might not suffer loss in anything on our account. For godly sorrow that is in accord with the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But worldly sorrow, the hopeless sorrow of those who do not believe, produces death. So there's a godly sorrow that leads to godly repentance. And that turns us, that's the change of heart that brings us back into God's will and allows us to fellowship with them. But there's a worldly sorrow, church. That's a sorrow is not sorry for, it's not a, a being sorry for uh, disobeying God and, and, and not following God's will. It's a sorry for, I'm sorry that I got caught. You know, that type of sorrow produces death. That's separation from God, okay? Um, and so repentance, true repentance is manifested through the visible manifestation of its fruits, okay? So followers of Jesus Christ who function with godly repentance in their lives, they are mature disciples who are skillful in the word of God. They're using the tools that they have and they're maturing as disciples, as followers of Christ. That is an example of maturation, spiritual growth, when you're able to use repentance and, and get yourself back on track because we're gonna, we all fall short at times. But that repentance is a gift from God, a rebound tool that gets us back in right standards and gets us back on track, church. Amen. I'm going to read Romans 2 and 4 as we close out. It says, or do you have no regret for the wealth of his kindness and tolerance and patience withholding his wrath? Are you actually unaware or ignorant of the fact that God's kindness leads you to repentance? That is to change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Seek his purpose for your life. It is God's kindness. It is his goodness through his word that leads us to repentance. It convicts us. It, it, it opens our spiritual eyes to let us see, hey, I don't really have this thing right, but I know, God, you can help me. So I, I submit myself to you. You can change me. I submit to your will and not mine. Help me to transform, to renew my mind and transform my life each and every day. That's what we're supposed to do as believers. Amen. Here's the last point. We're going to close out. And this is the other key point for followers of Jesus Christ. Understanding God's eternal wrath should inspire us to witness to those in our circles who don't know Jesus Christ. All right. We don't want our families we don't want our, our friends, we don't want our coworkers to enter into this lost eternity and say, I live with you, I work with you, I, inter I interacted with you for so many years, but yet you never told me about this truth, okay? The wrath of God applies to us if there will be people in hell, you and I know and love and work beside but who never heard how they could flee his wrath because we never open our mouths to be witnesses to them, amen? We don't want to stand before Jesus Christ and have him look at us and say, where are all your friends? Why, why isn't someone so witty, you know? Why was I too big of a problem to talk about? 
why were you scared to witness to them about me? We don't want to, we don't want that to happen. Because when we get to, to heaven, we don't have that opportunity to witness anymore because we, we're, we're already in heaven. Earth is the only place we have an opportunity to witness to people. We're given an opportunity to witness to folks. So don't, and this is for me as well, don't miss out on an opportunity that God provides you to witness to people, amen, when God provides that opportunity to you. All right, two takeaways from today's message, okay? If you are not saving and watching this message today, today is the day to run to Jesus because he is offering you a pardon. He is giving you an opportunity to escape his eternal wrath. And I'm going to tell you something. The clock is ticking. Like I said, it only takes one accident, one, one heartbeat. You know, we, are, we are only one thing, one incident away of being there if, if you fall into that category. Here's the, here's the other part for those who are saved, those who are born again. Use this time while you're still on the earth to be an effective witness for Jesus. Not just by speaking, but more importantly, with supporting actions that that's that that that's in alignment with what we say. You know, a lot of times we do a lot of talk, but we're not walking it. You know, witnessing is not only about what we say, but it's 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 even more about what we do. Amen. We don't want the people in our circle to lose out on God's mercy by not doing our part here's the thing and i'll tell you this we can't force people to accept jesus christ as their lord and savior right it's their choice but what we can do is we can be a positive influence on them and we can plant a seed in their hearts and it may not you may not you may not see that seed re, you know become you know uh, uproot and grow and become that tree and start producing fruit today the same day you plant that seed it may be a couple of weeks from now it may be some years from now but as long as you planted that seed plant those seeds in people and you pray and you let God deal with them amen praise God hallelujah church we need to speak to our brothers and sisters about the importance of escaping God's wrath in history and eternity. And here's the last part, embracing the forgiveness that he freely offers us when we come to him by faith, amen. So we're gonna close out next week. We're gonna cover another attribute of God and that attribute is his sovereignty his rule over creation. So look forward to sharing that message with you on next week. Um, we're gonna take this time to uh, thank everybody for, for joining today and uh, appreciate all that you do to support this ministry. I also uh, shared information if you want to plant a seed, uh, monetary seed, but if you wanna send a message uh, send an email if you've got something that you want to share please send that uh, send us an email at cogministries2018 at gmail.com um, before we close out and do our benediction I uh, want to give this opportunity to and, and, and just to, to let people know God's wrath is real we don't need to take this for granted this aspect of God for granted. And if there's somebody that in your life that you think needs to hear this message, don't hesitate, share this message with them because it's important for, for the world to understand who God is, amen. All aspects of him, amen. So um, I think we thank you, God bless you, we're gonna, uh, pray and do our benediction. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today, Lord. We give you honor, glory, and praise, Father. 
not just for what you do, but more importantly, for who you are. Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for being our divine teacher today, Lord. Thank you for he helping us see an, at an attribute that may not sound good to us, but it is good for us. Your wrath, Father, and, and, and help. And thank you for allowing us to see your wrath from your perspective and not our perspective. Open our eyes, open our ears to, to where we can receive you, Father, and so that we can operate uh, in a way that which will be pleasing to you, Father. Help us to function with a repentance, a repentant heart, Father. When we know we've done wrong, we see we've done wrong, help us to, to seek you, Father, to receive your forgiveness and turn our hearts. Help us to turn our hearts so that we can be, uh, can, can do your will, Father. Father, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, personally father and wants to give their life to you father father i ask that you touch them right now have them say lord i i repent of my sins and i place my faith in your son jesus christ lord i believe your son jesus died for me on the cross and i will live in covenant with him forever thank you lord for making that person, part of our family, the body of Christ. Amen. Now unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think, according to the power that works in, in us. May the love of God, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we have the blessed opportunity to come together in Christian fellowship. And all of God's people said with a prayer of agreement, amen. All right, God bless you all. You have a wonderful week and we will see you next time. Take care, love you.